Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. All right. Welcome back to FYI. I'm Tasha Keeney. I'm here with Brett Winton, our Director of Research and Cyrus Sigari. Hi, Cyrus. Hey, Tasha and Brett. Good to be with you. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. You know, Cyrus, I, I think I'd, I'd like to kick it off first and and just hear a little bit more about your background and how you got into the the aviation world and, um, you know, what, what you're so excited about today. Thanks for having me, Tasha and Brett. Um, in terms of my background, um, when I was six years old, a, a movie came out called Top Gun which uh, the new one just came out as well, as you may know. Um, and that kind of started a pretty significant trajectory for me. And I got pretty inspired about airplanes when I was a little kid. And so on my uh, 11th birthday, I got my first flying lesson. I started flying when I was 11. I soloed at 16, got my license at 17, was one of the youngest flight instructors and commercial pilots in the country at 18. I uh, was teaching flying while I was in high school, then went to university, studied aerospace engineering, then went to go work for a new aircraft startup called Eclipse Aviation in the early 2000s which was actually a very relevant company to talk about today because it's somewhat of a, um, a interesting example of what happens when you have disruptive innovation and in technology around aviation and venture capital and sort of some of the challenges with that as well. So anyways, the company raised close to a billion dollars in the early 2000s uh, to create a small business jet, a six person, 41,000 feet, 1,000 nautical mile range jet for a million bucks. And I was a propulsion systems engineer with them and then did flight test and um, ultimately ended up selling airplanes. And then in the early 2000s, started a company called Jet Aviva, which is today the largest seller of business jets in the world. Um, and then over the last 10 years or so, really starting to get into the technology side and investing and building community around sort of how we move people and goods, cleaner, faster, safer, lower cost on the ground, in the air, the sea, and in space. So really mobility broadly has kind of taken up my time and energy, but I love airplanes, been flying for 30 years. and. Uh, big part of my life. Great. Actually, so maybe maybe let's, you know, touch on Eclipse a bit more and like how how do you think sort of the story of Eclipse Aviation uh is uh relates to today and sort of what you're seeing um in the investment world or in the the private investing world um in in this space would love to sort of get your thoughts there. Yeah, so just some background. Uh, Eclipse Aviation was started by a guy by the name of Vern Rayburn, who was the 16th employee at Microsoft. And um he'd been a lifelong pilot and become very wealthy through his uh, time at Microsoft and had sort of recognized that aviation needed to be or had an opportunity changed in terms of it was so expensive to fly private and both from an operating cost perspective and acquisition cost perspective and and there was a lot of federated systems there was nothing like in terms of the aircraft systems there wasn't a lot of uh, integration and so he set off on a task to go build a new airplane company from scratch and when he put out this value proposition of flying a business jet for you know three, 400 bucks an hour at the time, that was what their projected costs were, and that you could buy it for, call it a million bucks, the world exploded with energy and excitement around this value proposition. And uh, Eclipse at the time had done a really great job of attracting some of the best talent in the world to come build this small little business jet. And what was really interesting is um, there was so much excitement around that one airplane that then a lot of other folks started to create a similar sort of product. In fact, every major, just about every major business aircraft manufacturer in the world started to build a small little business jet, sort of following behind Eclipse. Honda jumped in the game. Cessna jumped in the game with a Citation Mustang. Embraer jumped in the game with the Embraer Phenom 100. And then you had about 30 other startups from scratch that wanted to build an airplane as well. 
And so you had this one company that sort of started this revolution. It was called the Very Light Jet Revolution, the VLJ Revolution, which then kicked off the largest companies in the world in aviation to start to follow behind, and then a lot of upstarts. Now, fast forward 20 years later, most of those companies never made it. In fact, a very, very small percentage of those companies made it. Eclipse didn't make it. Eclipse has gone through several bankruptcies. And what's really interesting, perhaps the most successful of the very light jets uh, was the last to market. It wasn't the first to market. And it was a company called Cirrus Aircraft, which or Cirrus Design, rather. And they created a very simple single engine jet. And they were last to market certification. And it was expensive, but they kind of figured out the unit economics and the product really well from day one. It's everything the Eclipse kind of wanted to be back 20 years ago today. And this is an airplane that, you know, will land itself. It's incredible. It's, it's an incredibly sophisticated product. But I think the lessons learned here is that first to market isn't necessarily good when you start talking about disruptive innovation in aerospace. And we can talk about reasons why, particularly around regulation and supply chain and all that. Two is that it's bloody expensive. It's really, really expensive to certify an airplane and then to build an airplane company. We're talking billions of dollars to do that. It's really hard from a regulatory perspective to, to go through the, the FAA and the, the EASA and all the other regulatory pr providers. And um, it's a challenge now. Wait, 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 wait. I can see how you came from that experience to saying, what I want to do is get into venture capital and dump money into aerospace. This seems like a natural progression. You've seen like the flaming disaster you have. Like, so then why? Why do this now, given that history? Well, Brad, I think there's some pretty significant differences about what's happening now than what was happening before. And I think where what we're seeing today with urban air mobility and drones and sort of democratizing access to the sky is you have a few key unlocks that have come together that we didn't have 20 years ago. Okay, so the first major one is this concept of distributed electric propulsion, which allows us to have, you know, quadcopter type control of a vehicle that didn't exist back then. Then you've got now battery life that can allow you to do meaningful missions with, with vehicles that we couldn't do before, which also brings cost of operation down significantly. And then you, you have things like control systems where, you know, these new vehicles that are being created in something as small as a drone like this, a Skydio drone, you know, this thing flies itself. There's no pilot required for it. So you don't need to have the skill set and spend many decades of, of learning to actually be able to operate and then have a really simple UI. And so you put all these things together, you've got an unlock of, of capability to be able to affect billions of people. When we're talking about small little business jets, okay, maybe you're going to affect a few thousand people's lives. But now with all these convergences coming together, I think there's this opportunity really to, to, to expand into a much larger a subset of humanity. And a lot of our time as investors is investing in things that don't necessarily have a huge regulatory hurdle to get over. Um, and so, so just kind of like bound that. I'm super excited about what's happening in aerospace right now. And, but there's certainly a lot of lessons to be learned that it's not easy. And unfortunately, there's going to be companies that, that aren't able to, to kind of pull through the challenges related to, to certification and um, entry into service. But if I like think about this 10 years from now, I'm so excited to see the companies that are going to be created and the ones that have already been created, how they sort of maturate through that process. And this idea of being, you know, like slightly later and learning on your competitor mistakes, do you see parallels to what's happening today in sort of the next generation avi aviation, let's say autonomous vehicle space? I think there's um, certainly some of the bigger companies are kind of waiting to see what's what's going on before they really make big bets in the space. And Hyundai is a company that's made a bet in sort of urban air mobility. And they've been coy about exactly what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. But they've also said, we're going to kind of sit and watch and see how, how things play out before we put on the throttle all the way up. And I, th I think that's going to be a thing that we see with some just larger companies in general. They can afford theoretically to wait, but they can't wait too long, you know, for an upstart to be able to, to disrupt them. I do, I do see that. And, um, and I think how companies think about complexity of design is really a useful framework to this whole first to market thing. There's some designs out there that are really complex, that have lots of degrees of freedom that make it really challenging to certify with the FAA. And there's others that are much more simple that have theoretically reduce the, the, 
the hurdles to get a certification. It seems like optimum corporate strategy might be to wait if kind of the certification agencies, the FAA, you know, whichever country's certification agency is kind of like holding off. They don't even know what they want. And so they're not giving enough guidance or, or kind of like the rules are a little unclear. And so then if you've committed a lot of capital to a specific design and it falls short, then it's basically capital loss. And so um, kind of like from a, a well-balanced sheet company's perspective, they can hold back and say, well, we're going to wait till we see one thing certified. And then all of the kind of engineering uncertainty gets stripped out of the problem. And then we can throw capital at it. Is that a viable corporate strategy here? I don't necessarily want to opine on, on the corporate strategy, but I will speak on the the challenge that, you know, you, you are certifying completely new systems that have never been certified before. And, you know, the, the regulatory bodies, in this case, the FAA, this is a serious challenge for them to figure out how do they approach new technologies, not just one new technology, but multiple new technologies all being sort of put together to safely transport people. And um, look, I use the example of Boeing, you know, the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world took two years to recertify one system on the safest airplane ever built on the 737 MAX. So, you know, that's, that puts a little bit of um, reality into the challenges around regulation and certifying airplanes. Now, there's a lot of solutions out there that don't necessarily have to go to certification, and it's particularly around not moving people. And so I, the one area I'm really, really excited about is how do we take advantage of the sky to move things? And, and do it where you don't have to go through the same certification barriers. Not at least there's still airspace certification related items, but not necessarily the, the safety or burden that is required when you're, when you're certifying a full blown human carrying machine. What do you think in terms of, um, you know, who is the most forward thinking here? Perhaps, perhaps like first on a, on a global level in terms of like which countries are pulling ahead in terms of allowing, uh, let's say like more experimental things happen and then and then maybe here in the US on a state level what do you see happening every country has its own theoretical FAA and um, how the country sort of executive branch and economic development and the regulatories work together is different with different sort of motives sort of driving things so you're seeing places like New Zealand be really open to testing and doing unique things. In fact, um, WISC, which is a joint venture between Boeing and um, and Larry Page, you know they're operating in in New Zealand testing a couple of years ago. That's been happening for for a while. Um, China now, China is a really interesting place where you know in the United States we've got about fifteen thousand airports. In China, the r- number is roughly order of magnitude, like less than a thousand total airports. And uh, general aviation is a thing, it's a cultural thing here in the United States. You know, somebody can go to the airport, rent a Cessna for a hundred bucks, go fly around. You can't really do that in China. We have about 99% of our airspace in the United States is open. In China, about 1% of the airspace is open. 99% is controlled by the government. That's not very good if you want to be a traditional general aviation company, but it's actually a structural advantage when you're talking about flying autonomous vehicles, because you don't have to worry about you know, Joe Bob and his little Cessna popping around and, and running into one of these things. And and also China recognizes that they can move the regulator and business and government interests sort of kind of hand in hand, whereas we don't necessarily have those same sort of frameworks here in the United States and some other developed countries. So China's got an ability to kind of push things through a little quicker than, than we can here. And I, and I actually think in the United States, it's a potential existential threat if we don't sort of learn about how some of these other countries are operating, remain as we have been up to this point, the global leader in aerospace. Uh, but if we want to be for the next 50 or 100 years, these are some sort of structural changes I think we need to make and, and be reminded that, you know, aerospace is perhaps one of the most important industries in the world. I mean, it it's how we connect humans. It's how we we do commerce. It's how we we move things. And it's not something we can let the gas pedal off of. We got to continue to push forward. Could you unpack that a little? Like, why fly? I mean, you you learn to fly. It sounds like for the joy of flying, but like, why does it make conceptual sense to to like lob things around in the air as opposed to you know we have trains we could um, I can ride around in the car. That seems like you know if the system fails, I don't fall ten thousand feet to the ground. So it seems like a more convenient way to get around. Like, why go up? Well, I think there's a few different areas to unpack with that specifically. Um, I think with 
on like the biggest level of going up, you know, you can't put a train on the ocean. <laughs> you know, you got to you got to fly or you can take a boat and it's going to take a really really long time to do that, right? And then it's actually a, I mean so so speed is probably the first thing. Cost, I mean to put down train you know, I know in China, and this probably goes back to the regulatory sort of question we talked about earlier, they got bullet trains in China. We don't have a single bullet train in the United States. Um, and so the infrastructure cost to be able to put that down is is cost prohibitive, at least to replace the system that we already got today. There's one angle here that is a very human thing, which is there's something innate in the human soul and experience that wants to go up. We want to go climb mountains. We want to go look at vistas. We want to go hikes. We want to go to the top of the Empire State Building. We want to go see and have a different perspective. And, and it reminds me of this, um, this phenomenon that happens to astronauts, that when they come back to Earth uniformly, they're changed. And they, they have this thing they use to describe it called the unity effect, that when you are up in space and you're looking back down on the planet and you can see the planet without any borders, without any country lines, without any of this sort of made up human stuff, there's this feeling of oneness and connecting with the entire planet and with all the people and kind of, it, it sort of re-centers them. And I think every time you fly, you can have a very similar sort of experience. And that's, that's been my experience to have this uh, adventurism built in while also doing commerce and learning and connecting. And, uh, and it's a whole lot of fun too. Tasha, maybe you could comment from, from your perspective, like why is ARC interested in, in autonomous flying vehicles? Yeah, well, um, you know, from, from my work on autonomous vehicles, one of uh, a big part of the thesis is that, all right, well, autonomous technology will lower the cost of ride hail pretty dramatically. And, um, you know, it could be as low as 25 cents per mile. And like, if you look at Uber on average, it's about $2 per mile. So ultimately that'll bring a lot of people into the market that are not there today. And, um, you know, let's say over the next 15 years, we think that globally traffic could increase up to three times today's levels. Um, so then, you know, there's real incentive to somehow circumvent that traffic. And, you know, Cyrus, as you said, we see from our, our research on things like EV tolls um, that the, the, the cost of aerial travel will also decline. Um, so then it, it's like it's it's not only. Um, you know, more cost effective than it is today to ride in something uh, like a helicopter to then go in an autonomous EV tall. Um, but there's also more incentive to do it because you're getting around, um, you're saving a, a lot of time um, compared to what's on the ground. Yeah. And the way I think about it, there's so much bandwidth up there that's unused and there are problems with using it all. There's like noise and I guess visual pollution, but um, clearly there's like limited infrastructure bandwidth on the ground and there's a, unlimited and untapped kind of like moving thing bandwidth above. And if you, you know, if you're going across an ocean, you can get up into thin atmosphere. So you don't face as big a drag penalty to get from place to place. But Brad, I'm going to hit on that real quick. I, I maybe encourage all your listeners to like, just look up in the sky right now. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of them won't see anything up there. It's pretty hard to look up and see something flying around. Now I will tell you, there's this really interesting fact that there's somewhere between 40 and 100 billion organic drones flying around right now. They're called birds. <laughs> right? And just but we're talking tens, if not hundreds of billions of flying things in the sky as we speak right now. And you have a hard time seeing them. And somehow they they don't run into each other, maybe every now and then as an edge case. But um, I think there's a lot to be learned, actually, about Mother Nature, around how birds from a technology perspective, propulsion perspective, from their air traffic control perspective, from you know all the things they use to be able to use the sky as a as a, a different means of transport, we can learn a lot from that. And I think we're starting to see companies start to use some similar frameworks of how birds communicate, see things, use detect and avoid um, to uh, to be able to to move about the sky. You mentioned aerospace as as really like within the context of national competitiveness and um clearly um drones have proven a lot of their work in ukraine can you talk about kind of like civilian versus kind of military use of this technology and then how how would kind of civilian advance potentially translate into call it geopolitical strategic advance 
Yeah. I always find this area of discussion really interesting. You know, nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants to have these sort of geopolitical conflicts. But what is an interesting consequence of these really challenging times is the innovation that happens through challenging times. And so I would offer to you, if it wasn't for the U.S.-Russia relationship that goes back many decades or throughout the entire century, we wouldn't have Boeing 787s today. And I'll tell you why. During the Cold War, the United States government authorized Boeing, which was not making jets at the time, to go out and make their first real jet. And it was going to be the KC-135 air-to-air refueler, which is effectively the exact same airplane as the Boeing 707. So the U.S. government funded this whole sort of development to go develop an air-to-air refueler. But at the same time, they were able to create the framework of the 707, which, by the way, the um, tube of a 707 is the exact same as a 737. So you wouldn't have the 737 if it wasn't for the 707 and, of course, all the other airplanes that came after the fact. So that sort of geopolitical conflict created this, this national interest to invest and create technologies that had a civilian sort of application. Another example is if we didn't have Russia, we probably wouldn't have Uber today. Why would I say that? Well, uh, Uber's operating platform is GPS. And GPS came from the Cold War when the United States government was trying to create a system to track Russian submarines. And so think about all, the, they could not put a quant, quantify the investment they were going to make. They just knew it was an existential threat. Let's go invest, throw these satellites up and figure out how to do GPS. And then you can't even begin to quantify what the economic impact of creating GPS has been for the benefit of humanity. So while nobody wants to go to war, there's some interesting consequences that come from technology development that we're looking at today. And I think we're starting to see some really interesting bleed over from civilian side to military today that is actually been usually the other way around. We've had military technology that go into civilian, but now we're seeing it the other way. So this company, Skydio, which I just talked about a moment ago, this is a a thousand dollar consumer drone, Um, but it's also perhaps the most technically advanced flight autonomy system in the world. Um, That particular drone does not require a pilot to fly. It's got eight cameras on it. And that company has just signed a pretty significant contract with the U.S. Army for short-range um, reconnaissance missions where soldiers will have these on their back and they just send them off and go. They can look for bad guys. And, and Skydio's got these little buggers in Ukraine right now as we speak. And there's a lot of other, you know, you've probably seen some videos of quadcopters that are now just dropping, you know, mortars onto, um, onto Russian tanks that, you know, who would have thought that would be an application, but it, ha- it happens to be working quite quite well. So this is really the first war that we've seen. This sort of technology actually get to be used at scale. That's not these, you know, twenty million dollar predator drones that you know we've had since Gulf War One. We're using quadcopter type technology to be able to um, change sort of the dynamic of the battlefield, and I think it's woken up a lot of governments to see that you know this is stuff we really have to be careful about and invest in, and it and it goes to a really interesting dynamic that uh, played out with a company called DJI. So DJI is one of the largest drone companies in the world, um, but it's a Chinese originated company. And before President Trump left office, uh, he actually blacklisted DJI because of a concern around, you know, being able to have sensitive information that's gathered by these drones and military applications, industrial applications, it getting to to China. And um, And you can see why. Now in this sort of dynamic, you know, you, you'd really want to be clear that you have this sort of technology at home where it's protected and there's not sort of this adversarial sort of relationship that can potentially compromise the, the data set that's coming back out. Yeah, I'd like to actually just distill something there because, you know, I think you're right that there's like an economic competitive reason why you need to essentially tap a natural resource, which is your airspace and and access it for commercial and, and you know, passenger transport in a more efficient way. And if the new kind of chain of development, essentially the the cost of developing technology is collapsed sufficient that kind of commercial and consumer facing applications, which are moving at higher velocity, will be much more performative than a military type development effort, which is both more expensive and slower moving, then actually it's geopolitically important for countries to, to enable kind of like the commercial exploitation to happen much more rapidly because or else like you said if 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 kind of like 
China sets up its air, airspace and kind of opens it up or, or greases the regulatory re- wheels, then they'll have a much more performative set of commercial um, technologies that then can be translated into kind of military application more easily than will kind of uh, the U.S. or another country, which is which is putting a lot of sand in the gears of, of commercial development. I mean, that seems like, in some ways, the conflict in Ukraine, um, yes, it, it demonstrates, hey, this is useful technology. It also demonstrates, actually, the really useful technology is technology that has commercialized and scaled outside of like a DOD contract. And so then kind of your ability or a country's ability to be to be kind of militarily competitive requires there to be a lot of companies developing commercial applications that then are then adaptable as opposed to, oh, we're directly going to fund this specific effort where we know exactly what will work. You're spot on, Brett. This is exactly the sort of conversations that need to be had um, because as you guys know, things are changing so rapidly from a technology perspective. And to be able to move quickly, to be able to identify the sort of short-term, medium-term, long-term implications of these trend lines and how they could be used to exploit us if we're not using them in, in like protective ways, but more, more importantly, using it for commercial application to reduce the cost of moving people and goods, making it cleaner, faster, easier, and, and more democratized that ultimately is going to be able to use, be used in these other applications. Um, I want to give you another example uh, of a company that's done some really interesting things in the space. It's a company called AeroVironment. Now, AeroVironment has been around for for quite some time, and they were they were made quite famous um, by putting the first helicopter on another planet. <laughs> they created the Mars helicopter, which, if you stop and think about, is freaking crazy. There is a radio controlled helicopter flying on the surface of Mars, and I think as a society, we've gotten so used to extraordinary things happening that we like forget. Like what an exceptionally cool feat that was and vision to be able to like the idea to sit in the room, but like, Hey, I got an idea. Let's put a helicopter on the surface of Mars and see what happens. Anyways, uh, air environment was the company and they're, they're publicly traded. I'm not sure what their ticker is, but really, really cool team. They also create a product called the, the switchblade 600, which became somewhat, um, newsworthy recently because of its use in Ukraine. And it was primarily used for the U.S. war for, fighter, but you know the U.S. government uh, allowed Ukraine to use it, which is a drone that literally gets launched out of a mortar shell. The wings swing open. The drone flies up to, I think, 40 either kilometers or miles, pretty far away from wherever the, the soldier is. It's got a camera on it, and it's got a javelin warhead on it that can take out a tank. This is a huge improvement than with, from a warfighter sitting a quarter mile away with a javelin missile on his shoulder to, to go take out a tank. But, you know, a lot of their stuff with air environment started actually in civilian applications and earth observation. And they even have like a little hummingbird, radio controlled hummingbird that looks like a real hummingbird. It's flying around. Just, it's interesting how you start to get these blends of going back and forth between civilian application and military application. And, and, uh, look, I, I don't like spending a lot of my time and energy around war stuff, but look, the time is they are what they are. And these applications are, are relevant. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about autonomy in flight. You've said to me before, um, aut- autonomy is easier in the air. And like, as we've talked about on on um, in this conversation, you still have some obstacle avoidance that you, ne- you need to be aware of. Um, but we, you know, we already see like these small form factor drones having pretty great uh, autonomous capabilities. Um, I mean, what's what's really preventing, uh, you know, us from taking out the pilot sort of in, in larger aircraft? Is it just the safety certification? Are there still... Um, you know, major technical challenges that you see companies having? I'll hit your first point around aut- autonomy in the air versus autonomy on the ground. And I want to remind our listeners that 99% of the time an airliner is in the air, it's being flown relatively autonomously. You've got autopilots on from roughly 400 to 1,000 feet on takeoff, and then about 200 feet on landing. So on a 15 hour flight, it's on from off for maybe a minute out of that 15 hour flight. Otherwise, pilots are just manipulating the the autopilot controls. And so we've got an ungodly number of hours of experience in certifying autonomous systems for flight. So that's the first point. So we're really not that far away from bridging the gap to getting it to fully autonomous. In fact, it's already happening, just not to scale. And And I compare that against ground autonomy. There's all this 
attention and interest and investment in creating ground autonomy companies. My opinion, it's many orders of magnitude harder to do it on the ground than it is in the sky. First off, there's not nearly as many things to hit. You just got to like not hit the ground and not another airplane. <laughs> and usually you're pretty far away from the ground. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, run into another airplane is, pr it happens, but it's pretty unlikely. And there's some really, really great systems to, to prevent that from happening. What is very clear to me is that this is not a technology problem. The technology is 1,000% here today. People would argue maybe on, on autonomous vehicles, it's more of a technology problem. Like there's some serious edge cases with computer learning and, you know, that you guys are, are well-versed on that um, makes uh, ground-based autonomous driving in any condition very, very, you know, challenging to go solve, which, you know, I think we all agree that Tesla is probably leading the way there. But in the air, it's it's pretty pretty realistic. Now, back to the question specifically, what's what's holding it up? It's not technology. It's certification, public perception, and really cost benefit analysis of screwing up. You know, if you the idea of a airliner falling out of the sky because we went to autonomy, you know, it'll take one act of Congress to be like, nope, no more autonomous airplanes. We have to have pilots on board. There was an airliner crash. Um, I can't remember when it was, but I think I think the crash was the Colgate crash. And immediately after the crash, um, Congress changed the number of hours that a co-pilot on a um, for airline needed to have, like overnight. And it significantly reduced the number of pilots that could go to airlines. And then that's part of the drive of going to a huge pilot shortage is because of that change. Was the change necessary or not? I can we can argue both directions of that, but I'm saying we have to be really mindful when it comes to flying things. Society is really, really touchy, as in particular is Congress to change rules there. So, but I, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of work, particularly in moving things. So you think about how many cargo planes are flying around right now. So you're seeing companies like UPS and FedEx and a lot of other sort of feeder cargo companies that are, are really pushing limits on autonomy. And I think in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see full blown airplanes that usually are flown by pilots that are moving cargo around that are being flying autonomously. Now I'll give you one, one really cool company, which I think you guys are familiar with. And I don't know if your viewers can see, which is the Alia 250, which is is an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle company, uh, but their primary mission is cargo. It's not around moving people around, and you know they've they've partnered with UPS, and UPS is going to use this vehicle to dis disrupt their their logistic supply chain, and because it can take off vertically and it can fly horizontally and it's got a pusher and it's fully electric and eventually will be autonomous, but in the near term it's going to be piloted. Uh, if you think about the logistics supply chain for packages for UPS, they go from a distribution center to a truck, to an airport, to a Cessna caravan, to another airport, to another truck, to another distribution center. There is lots of stuff moving around there. A lot of gas being burned, a lot of people, a lot of leakage, you name it. With this vehicle, they can literally go from distribution center to distribution center and cut out all that waste along the way and do it fully electric and do it cheaper, you know, cleaner, faster, safer, lower cost. And eventually do it autonomously. So I think, um, you know, on the topic of public companies, you know, one company that on this area that has just blown my mind with the way they've innovated is Garmin. You know, so Garmin um, about in 2019 announced um, a auto land fun function in small general aviation airplanes that have Garmin cockpits in it, where if you're flying single pilot and there's a passenger on board and the pi something happens to the pilot, the passenger just hits one button. And that airplane will find the closest airport. It will avoid mountains. It'll avoid weather. It'll talk on the radio. It'll put the landing gear down. It'll put the flaps out. It'll set up for approach. It'll land. It'll stop the airplane. And all you got to do is shut off the engine and walk out. That's incredible. And that's in a couple million dollar airplane that that's happening. So, th so it's not a technology issue. It's really about all these other issues, so so social acceptance and, and um, regulation. But what do you think? I mean, 100% agree. And also there's an, there's an economic component in that if you're flying 300 people around, the marginal cost of that pilot is not nearly as meaningful to the cost of that whole operation as it is in the, like, you know, you're flying one person around, right? And so kind of like, it's much more economically compelling to try to take the pilot out to enable point-to-point -point mobility at a small, you know, either small packages or small people or individual people. Etc. And also, if you look at 
kind of like airlines generally per per mile traveled flying is I, I think it's two or maybe even three orders of magnitude safer than driving. So one, why doesn't why doesn't society accept that? Hey, we should accept more accidents here. And then two, which you know maybe that's a controversial statement. But two, how do we like unpick the knot of um, kind of the technologies available? Even on, in transporting goods, it's like, why aren't I getting Amazon packages um, via drone already? They've been kind of working on Prime Air forever. And, and clearly, or it seems clear that the economics should be very compelling there for both Amazon and the consumer. So what kind of gets past these hurdles? Is there a way? Yeah, well, let's hit on your last point there. And you mentioned Amazon. But I'd, I'd really encourage you guys and perhaps your listeners to really pay attention to what Walmart's doing. Walmart, in our opinion, is without question way ahead of any of their competitors in using the sky to deliver products to their their customers. Just two days ago, they announced their partnership with DroneUp, which they're an investor in DroneUp, that they increased uh, drone delivery access to 4 million households in the United States. As we speak in Bentonville, Arkansas, Residents in Bentonville can get packages delivered to them via drone with Zipline. And what's really interesting is the number one requested item from Walmart when people are requesting via drone is hamburger helper. And you just you have these really weird, interesting data points that you learn about, you know, people, hey, what are you going to have for dinner? Let's get some hamburger helper. Boop, hit it. Within 15 minutes, you got it at your front door. And I'm really happy you bring this the whole whole area up. So first off, I'd say pay attention to Walmart. They are super, super thoughtful on how they have been deploying technologies with partners, learning, and then going to scale. They're, so the first one I just talked about was drone up Zipline. I mean, Zipline is one of the most interesting companies on the planet. And they, you know, they started off in, in Africa delivering blood using drones to remote areas that didn't have access to, you know, you know, stocks of this very, very, you know, fragile good that can 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 go bad very quickly. And I think it's something like every minute a drone's taken off delivering blood to somebody in need. Um, And as we sit here, and I think this is what Zipline has shared, is their fleet of drones that are flying fully autonomously right now is the largest autonomous fleet of vehicles in the world that are moving continuously. And they also are are partnered with with Walmart and are doing some really, really cool, interesting things. So so there's really three major companies in the space. DroneUp, which is one I just talked about that... um, Walmart's going into 400 or 4 million households with in, in six states now, Zipline. And the third company is Wink, which is one of uh, Google's companies. So this this came out of X and their development of a drone delivery service. Um, they're also partnering with with large retailers. And what's interesting with, with Wing as a data point that came out of um, some of the early testing is their number one requested item was coffee. And who would have thought that coffee would be the first thing people would, would want? But if you think about the psychology of coffee, when you want your coffee, you want it right now. And if you can get it in three to four minutes via delivery versus 34 minutes of driving to the coffee shop and get back. And then you think about the unit energy cost per ounce delivered, it starts to blow your mind, right? So how would you go get your cup of coffee typically from your favorite coffee shop? Do you get into your 3,000 pound dinosaur juice burning vehicle, moving down the road. Hopefully you don't hit anybody. You pick up this eight ounce payload, you come back, you've wasted 30 minutes, God knows how much gas versus pretty much free in terms of energy movement with with a, um, with a drone. So this is an area I'm exceptionally excited about. Um, and it's, you know, if you kind of look at SpaceX, one of the really neat things about SpaceX, and this kind of feeds back to your comment earlier about accepting risk, you know, SpaceX was was okay with things blowing up when they had non-human payloads on top, but they were able to t- test and iterate and eventually get to a level of safety where you could then put people on and feel pretty good about it. Um, when you're focusing just on moving people stuff without the ability to accept loss without humans being involved, there's a much higher barrier of innovation. And so what I love about what's happening in this non-human carrying stuff like companies like Skydio, like some of the other ones we've talked about here, is that um, you can have a much higher acceptable loss rate to innovate and get better so that you can start to apply these technologies to moving people. So what do you think is driving the companies that you see as moving the fastest here? Is it uh, like, you know, better relationship, better relationships with like local 
policy people to actually make it happen? Is it just like they are willing to experiment more than their peers or, uh, you know, they just found one really great commercial partner? Like what what is driving the, the pace at which, um, you know, these things are scaling? I'm not sure if you could say there's only one item. I think it's like a constellation of interdependent required things to continue to move forward. So clearly regulation around this concept of beyond visual line of sight operation of drones is like a huge enabler to allow us to get to the point where you don't have to have somebody sitting in a tower looking to see the drone's not going to hit another airplane. But let's go back to like when drone flight started in 2014, like at scale. To get FAA approval to fly a drone in controlled airspace, you literally had to put in a request like 90 days in advance and paper to the control tower of the company that, you know, where you were in operating. Okay, that's where we started. Then we went to this technology called Lancy, which um, my, my partner, Ben Marcus, started a company called AirMap, which was, interesting enough, acquired by DroneUp, which Walmart's a big investor in, which digitized the airspace clearance process. Within five milliseconds, I put a request on my iPhone, you get clearance to fly in FAA airspace, which, by the way, good on the FAA to like have the ability to adopt these sort of technologies to be able to deploy. Then it goes to this idea of, of creating a framework for beyond visual line of operating site beyond visual line of, of sight operation of, of, of non-piloted vehicles, that's where you get into the place where, look, I fly airplanes, I fly helicopters. I got to tell you, the idea of running into a drone in my flying vehicle scares the crap out of me. I don't want to have a mid-air collision with a 20-pound drone because it could kill me or kill passengers. It's not a good deal. So I have like a huge vested interest in making sure that the regulations match up with real life applications and necessity. So there's technologies that are in development right now that will, in my opinion, alleviate everybody's risk and concern around this. Can't go into a lot of detail about it, but it's it's coming and it's it's really exciting. So let's say that that's a huge, huge part. I think technology is there. We don't have a technology gap to fill for this to continue to get move forward. But having real ways to make money is clear. When you can show unit economics of delivering things with drones that is profitable and less expensive than traditional methods, which has been proven through these companies I just talked about, then you start to get large-scale investment and deployment with the largest companies in the world that are moving more things than anybody else. And the last part I'll, I'll put that I think is super relevant to talk about in this area is entrepreneurial interest driven by sort of inspiration at a younger age and sort of what's happening in sort of the zeitgeist of society. What's really cool, if you look at, talk to the, some of the top um, aerospace engineering schools in the world right now, their enrollment numbers are through the roof. The number of people that are applying to go to aerospace engineering colleges right now is many times more than it was previously. It's become way more competitive and it's driven by like two major things, SpaceX, and everybody getting really excited about space and flying cars. People going, wow, the Jetsons are here. And oh, by the way, this year, 2022, is the 60th anniversary of the Jetsons. And now we, we've got it. It's happening real time. And it also happens to be the birthday of George Jetson. He was 40 years old in 2062 in the Jetsons. So he was born in 2022. So this weird sort of convergence of all, all, all these things. I, I hit that all too, that getting inspired, and this goes back to the beginning of the story with Top Gun for me, when I was six years old, being like, wow, flying, cool, I want to be a part of that, to actually getting enough interest to go learn and study and, and, and then to actually go do things and then eventually get on the other side of the cycle of maybe inspiring others to kind of fill, fill the gap. And to have Top Gun 2 coming out right now on top of SpaceX, on top of flying cars, on top of all this cool stuff that's happening in, in space. And it's just a good time to be alive if you like flying things. How does that intersect with, you know, as, as public market participants um, with the current economic and asset price volatility? What have you seen kind of in the venture space in kind of, these are all exciting ideas and it seems like investors, certainly in the public markets, are looking for cash flow next month. It's a high fixed cost to develop flying machines uh, with a payback period that's somewhere out in the future. How do you think about that? How do the companies that you're working with think about that? 
Yeah, so I think there's a few few elements here to talk about. One is if you're building large vehicles, like the ones we've talked about that are Jetsons that we want to go fly around in, the challenges around those is no different than the challenges of all the new EV companies that have started up from scratch. These are hugely capital intensive businesses with long development cycles with actually, if you think about any new airplane company, they really have to create like four companies at the same time. You got to create a company to design these vehicles. Then you got to figure out how to actually build them, which building them has nothing to do with designing them. Then you have to learn how to certify them. And then you have to learn how to like service them. Those are independent skill sets that are, are not at all linked whatsoever. So it's, it's really hard. And I think, again, of the 400 plus companies that are developing some sort of flying car, most of them not public companies, most of them are going to fail. That's my strong, strong belief. And I think there will be a handful that have the right design first that has reduced risk from a certification perspective and going out to, to market that has a right commercialization strategy that isn't dependent on some sort of magic happening between regulation and customer approval and design and blah, blah, blah. And the right team, probably that's number one thing, is having the right leadership team that has a long-term vision that's not in it for a quick buck. They recognize that this is not a five, two, three, four, five-year journey. This is 10, 20, 30-year journeys in this space. Um, and social want. And I think that social want thing is, is really important um, to continue to drive innovation here. And I think we got that. And there's enough focus around these sort of technologies being used to help move things cleaner, faster, safer, lower cost to democratize access and mobility. And I think you guys talk about this a lot. As you democratize access to mobility, quality of life goes up and the economies just do better. And it starts with simple, something as simple as a bike to something like Starship that's going to you know allow us to get on the other side of the planet in 40, 40 minutes. Kind of a long-winded answer to your, your sort of like setting up the stage for valuations and thinking about it. I, generally speaking, and as an early stage investor, anything that's super capital intensive, we kind of pull away from, from step one because we realize that there's just huge development cycles and a lot of risk there. Unless you got this magical combination of the right team, right go-to-market strategy, right complexity of design, and um, right sort of capital base going from, from there. In the long term, I think I'm really, really excited about it. But there's, as we've already seen in the marketplace, and it's going to be harder for some of these companies to to raise money. And, and hopefully, they, if they they are going to have access to capital, that they're going to accept likely lower valuations to be able to keep these things going forward and and, and take those lumps um, to continue to to uh, allow the business to be a going concern. What about on the acquisition side? Do you think that you know maybe you design, maybe you figured out or kind of figured out how to manufacture the vehicle, but then you know, there are big, big entities um, that could swallow you whole and kind of continue your path of development. Do you think that's, do you think that's a, a, something that a big entity would consider even? Um, or will they say, well, we'll let you fail, see where you succeeded and failed and just fund development internally to go after the same prize? I think so. I think there's, um, there's a likelihood and, and, and let's not even put it in the angle of them failing and then acquiring them. I think these bigger companies are going to start to see some of these companies continue to do well and say, hey, we want to be a part of that story. But look, you need the assets, in my opinion, unless you're Elon Musk or a handful of other people. Um, the assets of these large established OEMs, be either automotive or aerospace, to be able to build these things at scale. It's just so hard to get there and not, not screw up. There will be a few outliers that are able to do that at scale successfully over the next decade or two. Um, but I think partnering with some of the largest companies that are already have these the established infrastructure to support all that are, is, is going to be a, a more likely than not scenario that you see. And you mentioned beyond line of sight, without getting into the details, which you apparently can't, can't get into, at what time frame do you think in the U.S. we would be able to operate beyond line of sight, Jones? It's already happening now in certain areas. And I, and I think, so really the question is like at scale. At scale, yeah. Yeah, I'd say five years, which is... That's a blink of an eye from in, in, in as far as the sort of stuff we're looking at. Is it the blink of an eye? It seems like more like the blink I, of I take a really a long time to blink, blink my But in the scale of humanity's existence, it's a, it's a blink of an eye to have teleportation of my hamburger helper to my, my, my front lawn. 
Can I ask you a specific question? I, I'd love to get your opinion on this. There was a recent change for um, eVTOL certification that makes it look kind of similar to helicopters. Is that important or was that kind of just based on an audit, um, kind of the, uh, the, the answer to, to some tough questions that agencies were facing? What do, you, what do you think? Will this actually change for companies? Well, it's still not changed yet. It, it's a notice that there is a, a potential for change. And it, it could certainly have an impact from a certification perspective, pilot certification perspective. And it's like very live, this discussion. And it's, um, I know there's going to be a lot of continued discussion between the manufacturers, the FAA, and other sort of constituents to really get clear. And this kind of goes back to the point earlier. It's like, this is all, everybody's putting the engine on the airplane while we're flying at the same time. You know, the, the manufacturers, the regulators, the customers, the investors, the consumers. And my, my hope and desire is that we continue to have this like positive trajectory towards like getting to this utopian future of, of getting into the, our flying car and zipping around town from one side to the other. Um, but I think it's of paramount importance that, that regulators really approach this very thoughtfully and create a framework that's safe and reliable so that people feel safe when they get in them. But also to Brett's point earlier, like what's the, the, the line of being too safe where what's our acceptable, acceptable level of loss that doesn't completely stifle innovation. And I'm happy. I'm not that the person having to make those decisions because these are, these are very difficult decisions and, and how you unwind a certain level of safety is, is challenging. Well, to end it on a positive note, um, what are, what are you, what do you think, you know, we talked about beyond line of sight in the next five years. What is, what, what's happening like today? What is, what is the next thing that we're going to see sort of that to, you know, to leave our listeners on this more, more hopeful note? Like what do you, what do you think is, is near term? That's sort of the most exciting from your point of, point of view. Well, I mean, I, just this news that I mentioned around, you know, Walmart starting home delivery of 4 million homes in the United States, like that's, that's a really big deal. And you're not that far away from it going to 360 million people. I think it's going to be more challenging in really densely populated cities. Uh, but you know, in other parts of, of the country where I think a lot of folks are going to be able to experience this teleportation of their hamburger helper to their front lawn in, in like a relatively short period of time. So like that's super exciting. Next thing that's really exciting for me is, is look, there's some other modalities around these flying vehicles that carry people that aren't nearly as regulatorily uh, constrained. And it's this category that we call ultralight and really like more like toys, like get in and like go play with it. But it's not good. You can't fly it over city. You can't take passengers with you, but it allows you to like experience flight without having to be, you know, a highly trained aviator in a, in a t traditional helicopter or airplane. And there's a couple of companies that are actively doing that today. I mean, there was just a episode of 60 Minutes uh, within the last month where, you know, Anderson Cooper is out flying around in an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that's manufactured in Austin, a company called Lyft. Every day I wake up and I'm like, oh, my God, what an exciting time to be alive with the incredible innovation, incredible entrepreneurs, this un unlocking this um, third dimension, which really has been for all intents and purposes, very, very small percentage of humanity has been able to use. And, and just give you the statistic, one out of five humans living on the planet today has flown. It's a shocking number. Most people in the developed country, yes, you've flown. But if you think about the entire planet, 80% is not quote unquote online. And if you think about the sky in the same context of the internet, where the internet provides us low latency access to data, practically free, when we can bring humanity online in the third dimension to provide low latency access to matter, practically free, um, I believe good things are going to happen for society. And um, I hope that we get to have a small part in helping that happen and, and certainly cheering on all those that are making it happen. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's another great example, I think, of how innovation really touches the everyday consumer life um, because we're seeing these dramatic cost declines that allow, you know, the pervasive thing of it pervasive use of things like drone delivery. So they're, they're the ultimate beneficiary, which is awesome. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Cyrus, for coming on the podcast. Um, it was so lovely talking to you as always. Um, and uh, look forward to the next conversation. Gosh, you're great to be with you. Brett, always good to see you. And uh, 
thanks for what you guys are doing and educating folks about these incredible technologies and, and helping fund these, these amazing companies. Um, re- really appreciate it. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.